A reading from the first book of Maccabees. The officers of the king in charge of enforcing the apostasy came to the city of Modin to organize the sacrifices. Many of Israel joined them, but Mattathias and his sons gathered in a group apart. Then the officers of the king addressed Mattathias. You are a leader, an honorable and great man in this city, supported by sons and kin. Come now, be the first to obey the king's command, as all the Gentiles and the men of Judah and those who are left in Jerusalem have done. Then you and your son shall be numbered among the king's friends and shall be enriched with silver and gold and many gifts. But Mattathias answered in a loud voice, Although all the Gentiles in the king's realm obey him, so that each forsakes the religion of his fathers, and could sense the king's orders, yet I and my sons and my kin will keep to the covenant of, my, of our fathers. God forbid that we should forsake the law and the commandments. We will not obey the words of the king, nor depart from our religion in the slightest degree. As he finished saying these words, a certain Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer sacrifice on the altar in Modin, according to the king's order. When Mattathias saw him, he was filled with zeal. His heart was moved, and his just fury was aroused. He sprang forward and killed him upon the altar. At the same time, he also killed the messenger of the king, who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down the altar. Thus he showed his zeal for the law, just as Phineas did with Simri, son of Salu. Then Mattathias went through the city shouting, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and who stands by the covenant follow after me. Thereupon he fled to the mountains with his sons, leaving behind in the city all their possessions. Many who sought to live according to righteousness and religious custom went out into the desert to settle there. Ebum Domini. <coughs> to the upright I will show the saving power of God. God the Lord has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Gather my faithful ones before me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself is the judge. Offer to God praise as your sacrifice and fulfill your vows to the Most High. Then call upon me in time of distress. I will rescue you, and you shall glorify me. Dominus vobiscum, et spiritu tuum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. Gloria 
As Jesus drew near Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If this day you only knew what makes for peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days are coming upon you when your enemies will raise a palisade against you. They will encircle you and hem you in on all sides. They will smash you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another within you, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Verbum Domini Today is the feast day of Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, uh, the female patron of the secular Franciscans or of the Third Order Franciscans. And so we extend greetings and uh, fraternal blessings to all of our uh, brothers and sisters in the secular Franciscan order or our members of the Third Order of Saint Francis or those who are discerning the secular Franciscans. I have exhorted you year upon year about the life of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, so I'd encourage you to go to the archives of the EWTN website and listen to one of those gems of a homily on St. Elizabeth. That's all I'll say about her this morning. Don't hold it against me, you secular Franciscans. Um, but I would like to look at the gospel passage uh, today and really what we've heard all of this week. Jesus uh, there looking at Jerusalem and weeping over Jerusalem. If you can imagine our Lord, here's the city that was uh, precious to him. Here are the people that are his own. And these, it's through these people that he's walked with them through all these ages in order to prepare for his coming among men. And he sees that they do not recognize who he is. They weren't prepared for him. And they've rejected him. And so here we have God weeping over the holy city. Very powerful or moving uh, image for us to reflect upon. He could look upon each one of our souls this way. Our soul is this place that he chooses to uh, enter into and make his dwelling place. And yet, as we come to the end of the liturgical year, this is, it, it is important for us to be thinking in terms of uh, our own end, that we must be prepared for our death and for our encounter with Christ, and also his reign, as this coming Sunday we'll celebrate the solemnity of Christ the King that what awaits us at the end of time is that when Christ returns in glory, that we, God willing, will be able to reign with him in heaven. Um, but how would he look upon our soul if Christ walked past this city, you might say? Um, would it be something pleasing to him or would it be something over which he weeps? And then he simply makes this comment at the end of the passage today, they will not leave one stone upon another within you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now we know historically speaking that Jesus is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, which would happen uh, not even 40 years after his death. And we know that uh, under the rule of Vespasian, he uh, there was procurators in Jerusalem who were very brutal and very greedy in their interactions with the Jewish people. And so they rose up in revolt. We knew at the time of Jesus that there were these men called zealots. In fact, he had one among his own number and the apostles. And so the zealots saw the opportunity to lead this major revolt in the year 68. And what would an emperor do but put down the revolt? He had this power, and he sent his own son there uh, to restore order in the city 
of Jerusalem. And ultimately, we know historically that they surrounded the city, they besieged the city of Jerusalem and tried to starve the people out. And in the year 70 AD, uh, after five months, the Romans were able to uh, break through the walls of Jerusalem. They wore the people down and they were able to move in and conquer. And, and one of the, we're told that as one of them was coming through the wall, he was right there by the temple and he threw a torch in and torched the temple. Here's this beautiful, uh, uh, magnificent place where they worshiped God, where God made his presence among his people. Ultimately, it was no longer necessary for God's presence among his people was manifest or made complete in the presence of Christ coming among us in the word of God, taking flesh among us and making his dwelling in our hearts. There's no longer a need for this temple where the sacrifice was offered because in Christ we had the one and perfect eternal sacrifice that was pleasing to the Father. But how sad it must have been, and it is a sad reality that the temple uh, went up in flames and we're told that the Roman army showed no mercy. They went through the city killing and looting and they captured those Jews who are still living, sending nearly 90, 97,000 of them to the arenas to be killed. And so they endured uh, great suffering and, and persecution and death. And then they raided what was left of the temple, taking back to Rome the seven branch candlestick that we know as the menorah, the silver and gold weighing more than a ton, they took the curtain that surrounded or veiled the Holy of Holies and took that down and brought that back to Rome and the temple was demolished. And the words of Christ came to be fulfilled. They will not leave one stone upon another within you. All that was left of the temple was the foundation of the Western Wall. And this became known from that time on as the Wailing Wall, and we still call it that today. When we visit Jerusalem, many times we will go and stand with uh, Jewish men and women in, in prayer at the Western Wall or at the Wailing Wall, and we wonder, well, why in the world is it called the Wailing Wall? That was all that was left of the temple, and there was a law that was put in place for a time that no Jew could enter Jerusalem under pain of death except once every four years on the anniversary of the destruction of the temple. And on that anniversary, they could go and stand at that wall and weep. Now, that would be torture in itself, but this is what Jesus uh, prophesied. This is what Jesus said, no stone will be left one upon the other within you, especially that sacred place of the temple. Now, why is that? Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And to look at this in light of what we've heard the past three days this week in the gospel passages, uh, the question for us is, if that's what happens when you don't recognize the time of your visitation, you know, what happens to us when we don't recognize the time of our visitation? Uh, we have the Lord weep over us. I think that should be something in itself to move us to repentance. If any one of us would reflect today on the fact that the state of my soul is something that the Lord might weep over, that God himself might shed tears over my soul, it might cause us to change. It might cause us to prepare for the moment or for the time of our visitation. But if we look at the passage uh, from the gospel yesterday when we had this account that Jesus shared, the parable of giving these coins to the three different individuals and the people complaining, saying, we send word, we don't want this guy as our king. Now, how did that gospel passage end? 
Tell all of those people who did not want me as their king to come here before me, and I will slay them in my presence. So many of us live today, whenever we fall into sin, but even the mentality of our world is such that we say, we don't want him as our king. We don't want Christ to reign over us. So a question for us is, do I want Christ to reign over me? Jesus says in the, pa in the passage that we heard today, if you only knew what makes for peace, and what makes for peace is for Christ to reign over us. When we look at all the turmoil happening in the Middle East, these nations torn by so much violence, our own nation torn by all this disruption. You know, what's happening? We don't want Christ to reign over us. We don't want to profess our faith in Christ. You know, and so we can't find peace without that. But then you have that person in the gospel yesterday who received the one coin, and he put it in the handkerchief and kept it safe and then handed it back. And Yet this uh, um, challenging uh, leader basically rewards the one who, the two who invested the coins that they received and made more. And for us to understand that uh, what we receive from the Lord is not of our own doing. We're not the one toiling to make the money. What did that leader give to those people? He gave them what was his own hard-earned money. And he said, I'm giving you what is mine. And they didn't go and waste it. They didn't go spend it on themselves. Instead, they made more out of it to give back. They revered this man who was, had this authority over them. And they made a return to him of what he entrusted to them. And so the challenge for us then, or the question for us is, am I uh, living, have I received what the Lord has given me? It's not of my own doing this life of grace that I've received in baptism. It's completely the gift of God, and it's, a completely, it's completely a share in his own treasure. It's his own life, a share in his divine life, his glory that he has put into me in baptism. Now, am, am I investing myself in that life and making that grow within me? Or am I squandering that or doing nothing with that. And we know what happens if we do nothing with that. And we should be at the end of our life ready to make a return to God, to give this back to him with great gratitude as one that we revere. And we say, you know, you've entrusted this to me, and this is, I can't repay you, but I can give back to you what you've given me with something more because of my meager efforts, but it's what you've given to me that I return to you. And then simply to look at the gospel passages of Monday and Tuesday, we had on Monday the blind man sitting by the side of the road. And what does he ask? Who was all that noise? Who's passing by? You know, Jesus is passing by. And Zacchaeus, he's a short little man and he can't see, but he wants to see Jesus. And so he goes and runs just to climb up that tree in order to put his eyes on him. Now, both of those men realize the time of their visitation. Christ is passing by. If you put yourself in their sandals, you'd realize they probably realize it's either now or never. Either I encounter Christ today, or I never will again. He's passing by. And for each of us, we say, boy, that moment when Christ passes by, what is that in my life? It's called your life. Our life is so short and so brief, this little period of time in history that we're put on this, the face of this earth. That is the time for us to have this encounter with Christ. It's not something that we should waste or squander, but that we have this same eagerness to cry out to the Lord, you know, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, have pity on me. 
And the Lord asking us, what is it that you desire? Drawing it out of us. What is it that you want? I want to see. You had one more word to that. I want to see you. And Jesus rewards that. Your faith has given you your sight. Or for Zacchaeus, you know, come down from that tree. You've already seen me, Zacchaeus. Come down from that tree. Imagine Father Dominic up in the tree. That's how I always imagine Zacchaeus, you know. And Father Dominic, come down from that tree. You've already seen me now, and I'm going to come into your house, and I'm going to visit you. Zacchaeus had already opened his heart to the coming of the Lord. And then Jesus says to him, now come down. I am not just entering into your home. I'm going, I desire today to enter into your heart. And what has happened to Zacchaeus? He's a different man. He's basically said, anything that I've extorted, anything I've done wrong, I wish to set right. Because now Christ reigned in his heart. And what did those two men know? They knew peace. They knew what made for peace. This encounter with Christ, this seeing him, this profession of faith in him. And so, as we come to the end of the liturgical year, that's what's good for us to meditate upon. I've made in my life, by, in my baptism, this profession of faith. I've told the Lord I want to see. He's entered into my heart. And now, how am I living that? How am I investing in preparing to make a return to the Lord of that grace that he's given me, that life with which he has filled me? And do I allow him to reign over me? Do I reject him as my king, or do I accept him as my king? Because I know what makes for peace is that Christ reigns over me.